happy Friday, everyone. Today we're going to talk about how the carbohydrates we eat can become fat in our blood. I get this question a lot, and it's really a great question because it seems completely counterintuitive. So we're going to discuss it. But before we begin, I want to tell you that I am adding, along with this talk online, a whole bunch of different um, medical articles that go along with this discussion today. So they're covering in detail more than I'm going to be able to cover in this talk. So anyone who's interested in learning more, I really encourage you to just pull some of these articles up and read more thoroughly about it. All right, if you remember the first time we talked about cholesterol, we talked about low-carb, high-fat diets improving something called atherogenic dyslipidemia. Clearly, with the word atherogenic in there, we can understand and is true that this kind of cholesterol derangement does lead to heart disease. So atherogenic dyslipidemia is considered high triglycerides and low HDL. And we do know, again, that this is associated with a greater risk of heart disease. So today we're going to focus on the triglyceride portion of this and fatty acids. So a triglyceride is actually a molecule that consists of three fatty acid fatty acids attached to something called a glycerol molecule. So let's talk about what we know about these molecules. First, I want to point out that information on how triglycerides and fatty acids are made was known very well early back in the 1950s. Of course, we've gained more knowledge about it since then, but information about carbohydrates causing a problem with triglycerides is far from new news. In fact, it's been called carbohydrate-induced lipemia in the medical literature for a very long time. So why, again, have we been told to eat so many carbs? We'll add it to the list of reasons why it doesn't make sense. But let's talk about the two carb, or excuse me, two triglyceride carrying lipoproteins. The first one is something called a chylomicron. A chylomicron in the world of lipoproteins is a very big particle. A chylomicron is formed in the intestine. So when we consume fat and it comes in through the intestine, in the intestinal cells, it is packaged into these chylomicron particles. And then they're transported into our lymphatic system and eventually find their way into our blood. Now, a couple important points about chylomicrons. They come from the fat that we eat. This is very true. But here's the thing. Chylomicrons in a normal, under normal conditions last for less than 30 seconds. They're not around very long. Now, of course, in the conditions of insulin resistance, chylomicrons last a lot longer. It's part of the problem. And here's another interesting fact. The chylomicron itself is formed from fat in the diet, but one of the things that studies have shown us that cause chylomicrons to last longer, number one, I just said insulin resistance, but number two is the carbohydrates in the diet. It keeps the chylomicrons from being broken down and absorbed as quickly as they're supposed to. So what we find out is that this postprandial state, right after eating, the time when the chylomicrons are the highest, but again, they're only supposed to last for seconds. We actually wind up seeing a lot more of this postprandial time because of the way we have been told to eat. I'm sure that many of you have heard many times, eat every two hours. You should be eating six, maybe even more times a day. Well, unfortunately, one of the problems that this advice has caused is that we're in the postprandial period, after eating period, essentially 16 hours or more a day. It's actually not supposed to be that way. And it's one of the reasons that we're having a problem with these elevated triglyceride levels. So if we decrease our eating frequency, that's something that can really improve this. We shouldn't be postprandial for more than half of the day. Second, again, I want to go back to tell you, chylomicrons are made from fat in the diet, 
but the length of time under normal conditions that they last is very short. It's carbohydrates and the insulin resistance caused by those that decrease the breakdown of these. Okay, now we're going to move into the main lipoprotein carrying type, triglycerides. Again, chylomicrons not around for very long. But the ones that last longer, and when we are taking fasting triglycerides, the ones that are represented by that lab value are ones found in something called VLDLs. So VLDLs stand for very low density lipoprotein. These after chylomicrons, which are the biggest lipoproteins we have, are the second biggest. And VLDLs are formed in the liver. So VLDLs are actually another little tidbit here. What become LDLs later? We don't form LDLs. They actually form as the breakdown product of VLDLs. But there are VLDLs in the liver are formed, again, three, tri, three fatty acid molecules attaching to a glycerol molecule. So a couple of things. There are four sources of the fatty acids in our bodies to make these VLDL triglyceride carrying lipoproteins in the liver. And usually, under normal conditions, a very small source of these fatty acids should come from what's called de novo lipogenesis. De novo lipogenesis means fat made out of products other than fat. So it's made in the liver, new production of fat is what de novo stands for. So it's fat that's coming from non-fat, made. What is it made out of? It's made out of glucose. Now remember, I just said, under normal conditions, de novo lipogenesis in the liver is low. But under a high carbohydrate intake, it can increase dramatically. And it's one of the big problems causing fatty liver disease. So, de novo lipogenesis is one. Another couple in, in important points. In a carbohydrate-fed state, long-chain fatty acids can be synthesized from something called acetyl-CoA, which is produced from glucose. Carbs, a carb-fed state favors the joining of the fatty acids to the glycerol molecule. Again, making these triglyceride-carrying lipoproteins called VLDLs. So it's very, very important to understand. When we're talking about how our nutritional intake affects the fat particles, the triglycerides in the blood, those are, again, remember the name that we, came, that we got to way back in the 1950s, carbohydrate-induced lipemia. So even though the nomenclature or the names on this makes it very confusing, what we can say is high carbohydrate intake dramatically increases these triglycerides, and that is an independent risk factor for heart disease, and it's very important. Another incredibly important thing to understand is saturated fat in the blood. So we do think that saturated fat in the blood is probably a problem. This may even have something to do with the creation of insulin resistance. But here's the problem. The saturated fat that we eat is not what becomes the saturated fat in our blood. In fact, more than one studies have shown that the higher carb intake one brings in, the higher the saturated fat in their blood becomes. So eating saturated fat encourages fat oxidation. That means using fat for energy. But the higher carb intake that we have actually does increase the saturated fat in our blood. So when we hear people say, well, it's all the fat that's causing our muscles to create insulin resistance, I have a couple of things to say. And the first one is, if anyone tells you they are absolutely sure how insulin resistance starts, that's not the truth. Unless they're hiding some super fantastic study that the rest of the world isn't aware of. The jury's still out on it. There are so many moving parts when it comes to the cause of insulin resistance. We certainly do think that fatty acids, especially fatty acids affecting the muscle, 
have something to do with the beginning of insulin resistance. But the big question we have to ask is, where are those fatty acids coming from? And the answer is high carbohydrate intake. So when we lower these, again, a good and plausible explanation of why we see such dramatic decreases in triglycerides and, of course, insulin resistance. So another thing is carbohydrates actually will decrease the polyunsaturated fats that we find in the blood. So both very, very important things. Again, I really thank everybody for their attention. I hope this began a good explanation of how the carbohydrates we eat actually become fat in our blood. And again, please feel free to take a look at some of those articles that I post along with it that provide an even more detailed explanation. Thanks again, and please keep the questions coming. I'm going to try to address them every week.